The project interdisciplinary collaborative learning and teaching for resilient wood resources and innovation in a digital world is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. The project is co-funded under the strategic partnership of Erasmus Plus with the duration of 36 months. We say that with Wood Plus, objectives are targeted opportunities are taken and make a difference under the Erasmus Plus umbrella. Activities are conducted by consortium of four partners, Mendel University in Brno, Czech Republic, acting as a coordinator, University of Natural Resources and Life Science, Vienna, Austria, University of Hamburg, Germany, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and an associated partner, Innovavut, from Belgium. Wood Plus objectives are to support the additional inspiration of the new generation of researchers, to raise the awareness of a wide range of material application, to redesign the learning environment with innovative online modules, to individualize and internationalize the learning pathways. Woodpath aims to strengthen collaboration in the field of wood science and technology with particular focus on less used wood species, to achieve brain circulation for students and researchers through strengthened language competencies, to contribute to future-oriented curricula with a broader focus on tree species diversity, to develop green sector skills by promoting industrial exploitation of less used wood species for high value chain utilization by focusing on innovative material developments. Wood Plus also aims to stimulate and support students and researchers' creativity by fostering education diversity networks to take advantage of diverse educational and research backgrounds to foster digital competencies by pushing distant learning and innovative learning methods. Wood Plus activities include intellectual outputs such as webinars, ebook, virtual laboratory, experimental design and data analysis, multi-prior events such as conference, and learning, teaching and training activities such as summer schools, workshops and long-term teaching assignments. As Gerald mentioned, we have, uh, it's a federal German research institute, which is um, divided into 15 specialty institutes. And here in Hamburg and Bergedorf, we have a special cooperation with the University of Hamburg. Um, the main parts are the agriculture and food economy, um, the forestry and wood economy, as well as the fisheries and aquacultures. And these three um, main parts are connected all together via the economics, ecology, and the technology. So every, um, every single um, um, special part is connected together. So we have a good, um, yeah, a good uh, information base uh, for the um, federal, um, for the German federal. Uh, in Hamburg, we have, um, um, four parts. So this is the quality of wood and wood products, the bio-based resources and materials, and uh, the impact of wood utilization on environment and climate. And the fourth part is the human health and consumer protection. Um, these four research uh, groups are working um, uh, uh, in detail here um, with the structure and property relationships in solid wood and wood composites. Um, they have also a look at the quality of new exchange wood, wood, plantation wood and new composites. So in big investigations regarding their properties were uh, done here. And uh, something very interesting and uh, pretty new, I would say, is the identification and the fiber atlas. Uh, 
the identification via fibers. The wood identification we have a long history. This is uh, done um, for several decades. So um, this is very interesting to analyze uh, or to find out the wood species uh, through the single elements of the um, um, wood tissue. Um, for the identification where there's a special competence center on the region of timber. And here we have not only the microscopic identification of wood by the fibers, we also uh, corroborate with the genetic methods. And here we can uh, identify individual logs during the process processing stage. Methods are developed for um, uh, for the identification in pulp and paper, as we have seen the fiber atlas and the training on that. And yeah, if you want to identify wood species, you have to have a good background. So approximately 35,000 samples and about 11,500 uh, 11, wood species are located in the scientific wood collection here in Hamburg. And yeah, the microscopic slides are the most important things uh, to uh, compare your slides from the investigated uh, samples. So we have approximately 50,000 of them. So our, uh, yeah, we have a lot of them. So it's a good uh, opportunity uh, to investigate in this direction. When it comes to the biobased resources and materials, here we have um, this group uh, analyzes, uh, for example, biobased resources for ativis, polyuterine forms, or composites. And they have also the development of biorefinery processes or the thermo thermochemical conversation of wood, and as well the analysis of paper. It's one part of this group. And the impact on the climate. Here we have um, the greenhouse um, effect on the uh, regarding the wood sector, and the life cycle assessment of wood products. These are the main parts uh, which uh, the group is dealing with. And for and the, uh, the last but not least, the part it, um, deals with the emission, for example, from wood products, and uh, the development of analytical methods for the quantification of biosets and preservative preservatives treated in wood, uh, treated wood. So here we have the consumer um, aspects in the in the middle of uh, in the focus of this group. And here uh, also the monitoring of wood damage in insects and fungi is uh, yeah, located. So all in all, we have an institute that covers um, yeah, the four, I would say the four most important aspects uh, regarding wood and wood trade and wood usage. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy to, to be part of this institute. And um, if you have questions or you want to contact, this is the director, it's Professor Dr. Andreas Krause. And uh, yeah, you find it on the web page if you want to contact uh, the institute or us. What is the physical background of this technique? We have uh, a source. We, uh, you can see it in this, um, I use the laser pointer here. This is schematic drawing. It's not the best, but it's, I think it shows you how it works. We have a, a source that gives you the, the, the light, I, uh, I would say. Um, and then you can um, see that the light goes through your objective and interacts with the objective. So the principle of the technique is the interaction of light with the investigated material. That means we can topically investigate uh, this uh, section, and this is based on the ultraviolet illumination of semi transverse sections of woody tissue. So we have an interaction with the UV light and the investigated sample. And this reaction is based on the lambert bersch law. So that means we have A as the absorbance, and how does it connect? Um, how does the relationship between the intensity that goes through and uh, the intensity um, um, that you detect afterwards? And that means uh, that the passing through um, E uh, lumen 
results uh, in the intensity emerging from the lumen. And in case of the wood section, the lumen is reduced to the intensity of the cell wall. So with this aspect, or with this um, information in the back, we are able to, um, yeah, to analyze uh, the intensity or to say something about the intensity that is absorbed by the sample and what we uh, can measure afterwards. So the range between what we work with is um, yeah, here in the UV light, it's between 200 and I would say if you, we do some point measurements, we go up to 700, yeah, uh, 600 nanometers. So this is our UV range we work with. And the specialty is that, um, yeah, lignin is uh, um, displaying a special characteristic UV, LED, UV absorbance spectrum. And um, this is about around uh, the 280 nanometers. And it's uh, the reason for that is the associated phenylbenyl groups, uh, several chromo chromophoric, chromophoric structural elements. So that means, um, yeah, we see just the lignin. No other component of the major cell wall has the ability to absorb this or to uh, interact uh, in the way uh, lignin would do it. That's why we can say that the, the intensity of the absorbance may therefore be related to the concentration of the lignin across the cell wall. So this is what, what, um, a very important aspect when we want to investigate um, the wood samples. So, and we are interested in the lignin or in other phenolic uh, structures. This is the physical background, <laughs> why we can see something when we do uh, apply this technique. And here we have the uh, device. It's called a um, universal microspe microscope spectrometer. Uh, it's from Zeiss. And we have uh, different opportunities to investigate uh, our samples. We can, um, um, do some area scans and uh, with, with this um, scanning stage it automatically automatically scans uh, several areas that we defined before. It's depending on what on what kind of uh, wood samples we want to investigate and therefore we choose a different wavelengths. So the softwood and hardwood lignin is different as everybody knows. So and depending on this um, absorbance maximum of these lignin types, we choose for softwood 280 nanometers and for the hardwood lignin we choose at the 278. The resolution of these area scans is very high. So we have a resolution about 0 0.25 micrometers to 0 0.25 micrometers. So every little pixel gives us a very high and very sensitive information about um, yeah, the interaction of UV light and the wooden tissue. Um, yeah, the first pictures were always in grayscale levels and uh, this um, um, spectrometer is uh, able to convert these um, grayscale levels into 14 basic colors. And if you want, you can change something in the program. So you get also 56 um, uh, different colors. But 14 is a good thing to uh, display and to uh, visualize um, how the lignin uh, distribution is over the cell wall. Yeah, so this is the conclusion. It enables, this technique enables a direct imagination of lignin distribution and lignin modification. So this modification can be um, uh, can be done by fungi, for example, or by um, aging or yeah, other influences or modification, for example. And this can be displayed um, in the wood tower. And the yeah, special, uh, the very important thing is that you don't have to destroy your, your sample into very small fragments. You just have a slice of uh, your wooden tissue and you can see it right there on the place where it is. So you can have a look at in situ. So you open up a window right into your um, very small sample and yeah, can have a look at uh, what's going on in there. <clears throat> 
So now we're gonna start the, um, the, the interesting part. How do we have to prepare our samples to be ready to investigate? Um, first, you have to evaluate your material. So what is the question? What is the um, bigger, bigger frame of the project and what do you want to look at? Um, then you have to select an area of interest. <clears throat> For example, um, you have a surface yet you know, or, or a, um, an area which is close to the outer, outer part and you want to have a look at this or you could say okay I don't need to know the outer parts I would like to have a look into the inner parts for example how far is the uh, fungi grown into the wood cell walls and what is the reaction of the cell walls there um, I mean you have, when you are yeah Ready to ready if you know what you want to see and what you want to prepare, then you start the preparing and you prepare a sample of this size. It's very small, so the cross section is about you know, uh, 1.5 to 1.5 millimeters, and the length can be five millimeter. So um, you can imagine a, a match, for example. So this is um, yeah the size of the of our samples that we have to prepare. So, and uh, we prepared some small videos. So you have a right uh, a view into the lab. Yeah, I take you with me into the lab and you can see how our uh, staff is preparing um, the sample for the UMSP investigation. We start with the clamping. So you have your, your part, which you, are, um, which you have selected. And now it's time to prepare uh, a very small sample. So I hope we don't hear anything. So I'm gonna talk. Um, with the tweezer, you just grab your sm a small sample. And here we have a block uh, with, a, with a, um, yeah, and, and a, so a short, uh, a small thing that to fix it. Um, and then you can ha um, have a look if you have it in the right position. So every side should be in a rectangular angel. And uh, yeah, this is the first step you have to do. Okay, after that, you have to orient uh, your sample. What means orienti orienting? Orienting, it's, um, for us, it's pretty simple because we are working with food anatomy and we are daily confronted with the cross section, with the rail section, as well as the tangential section. So these are the sections and um, you describe them by saying how you cut the direction um, to the stem axis. So the cross section is clear. You have it uh, cut rectangular to the stem axis. For the radial, you go through um, parallel to the stem axis. And for the tangential, it's parallel and um, rectangular to the wood rays. So these are two aspects we have to keep in mind by preparing tangential sections. So for our uh, small sample that we want to um, produce, it's important that you have really all these uh, three uh, sections in a rectangular angel. It's important for the um, analyzation, for the measurements, as well for the um, impregnation with the, um, with the embedding um, material, embedding resin. So my colleague, she starts here with the preparing of uh, the sample. So you have a pinocular here. Uh, laser pointer goes here. Okay, you have the binocular, and there's a screen where you can follow how she um, cuts it. She uses a razor blade, a very sharp one, and. Um, and you get these nice clear cuts here. So she's getting from the outside to the inner part and gets closer to the um, to the size we want to have for the embedding process. Okay, Here's, uh, here you can see um, the finished uh, sample inside. From the outside part, you see still the, um, 
the rest of the sample? Does it move? I don't know. Yes, no. now it's moving. So this is a small sample she prepared. And uh, if you go far a little bit far away, then you see how much is uh, surrounding this small sample. So it was a small block you have seen with the tweezer. She, she prepared it and uh, set it into the holder. And then she cuts off all the rest uh, from the outer part, which is not as interesting. And she um, yeah, gained a, a very small one. And uh, yeah, here you have the cross section with the uh, ray cells. So after that, yeah, we have to get the final specimen out of this, um, the rest of the um, material. Therefore, she uh, will open the whole one. And use again the tweezer to get out of the specimen. The specimen. She plays it on a wooden surface so she can cut on the, uh, on the uh, ground, on the plate. So you see it's very small. Now she cuts uh, the rest off from the surrounding material. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a hardwood species. Uh, it's not really easy to go through, but here in the middle, we now have our final specimen. Now she, um, yeah, um, cuts the small things uh, which are in the bottom of the specimen away and uh, yeah now it's finished yeah and it's very important to have a good um, structure in the, your lab so your your piece or your your glass or whatever you want to um, to to store it uh, it has to be signed with the correct uh, number and uh, so you can be so you can make sure that you have the right sample the right specimen in your with the right um, definition and the right name in the right um, box for so the sample preparation is finished we have a small sample with about five millimeters in length and 1.5 millimeter in the widening. After that, <clears throat> and you see here, uh, it, there's, uh, it's a diagonal cut. So we have a lot of cells which are cut, um, which are cut so they are open because now we wanna have um, the sample embedded. We use a mild vacuum embedding and epoxy resin according to spur. So this is a medium which um, polymerizes not only outside of the sample as well as um, also inside. So it stabilizes the sample very, very good. So we are able in the next step to produce very thin slides. But first we want to have a look at the uh, epoxy resin embedding. On the left side you have the glass with the resin and here on top you see um, the sample. So we still have some air inside the sample and this is not very helpful to have a very nice and smooth and complete um, polymerization of the, um, of the um, epoxy resin. And after the vacuum, the sample lies on the ground of the glass. So it's completely sucked full with the epoxy resin. Um, this is a very important step and you have to take your time and uh, do it very uh, carefully. Um, when you're ready with the um, vacuum uh, step, 
you go to the next step and here we have uh, um, yeah, a little form where you put uh, the resin and the sample in there. So be careful when you put the resin in, the, in this uh, forms, they have all numbers and you have to make notes about uh, in your lab uh, book about the, the uh, specimens which you're putting in which box. So you, she uses a wooden stick to grab the little samples and then they, she place, it, place the samples of specimen into the um, yeah, prepared uh, form and the next one. So she's preparing two of them in here and she um, yeah, touches them and bring them in the right position. It's important that they still have enough resin underneath as well on the top. So it's not good if your sample um, starts to rise up to the um, to the surface and on the top. And it's not good if you have it just right uh, on the ground. So the epoxy resin should cover the whole samples, sample in a, in a good way. So it's good surrounded and you don't have any damages afterwards um, when you start to um, cut the samples. And uh, if, you, um, if the sample comes up somehow, or if you want to fix it, you can uh, just uh, bring the small, the small, oh, it's not, we have some, I'm sorry. <laughs> she brings a little stick into the, into the form. And um, yeah, can and she fixes uh, it by um, by putting it uh, downwards. So you see here, oh, it's, it's not so nice to have to switch between the mouse and the laser pointer. Here you see the stick, the small stick. It goes in the right angle angel uh, to the. Um, specimen which is covered inside so it hinders the specimen um, to move during the curing process so um, yeah you have to have um, calm hands and be careful by preparing so um, yeah after you put every um, every specimen in its, in its uh, small place um, the, the, the um, it starts to um, the curing process uh, starts for 12 hours. For 12 hours uh, at 70 degree. So the polymerization process is catalyzed by heating. So yeah, and afterwards, so you can prepare it on the one day by, by cutting and doing the vacuum step and impregnating with the epoxy resin, putting it into the small um, forms. And then the curing can start at the afternoon and you're finished in the next day. And you can work with the samples at the, ne uh, at the next day. Um, yeah, before you cut uh, your specimen by the ultra microtome, uh, it's good to prepare the surface. So you have um, to have, um, uh, um, <laughs> you have to have this form <laughs> for having um, the le uh, the, uh, as less as possible damages. So the knife comes from here and uh, you don't have so many smashed or crashed cells by having this, um, this form. So that means for our specimen here, you have the wood waste here and then you cut in this direction. Um, you section um, the, the, the specimen by an ultra microtome with, equipped with a diamond knife. So um, this is how, the way how it looks like. Here we have uh, the knife, the whole thing, it's called knife. And here's the diamond knife itself. And there's a basin, it's filled up with uh, distillate water. And in this a holder, this is a whole thing that holds your specimen. And your specimen sits right in front of um, in front of this um, 
thing. And um, in this case, you don't move the, your knife um, cross to the to the uh, specimen as you would do it by an uh, just normal microtome. There you have your, your, your sample, it's fixed. And then you go with your knife across uh, the section you want to produce. And here we have it a little bit uh, different. Here you have your sample and the sample is moving across the knife. So you have to do it very um, carefully <laughs> because it's a diamond knife and uh, you want to have surfaces or cuts without any damages. That means you don't uh, want to have a small, um, a small part on the knife which um, cracks or which uh, would smash your uh, slide because the thickness of the slides you produce here is about one micrometer. The thickness of the slides you will produce by the microtome for the light microscopy uh, sections, they are about 20 or 16 to 20 micrometers thick. So we are very, very thin and these sections are fragile. That's why they are floating on the water and you have produced like a band. So every section sits close to the next section and uh, you go de deeper into the sample always by one micrometer. And as um, yeah, and it depends how many slides you take, you're in the different uh, depth of the sample. Um, when they are floating, yeah, I'm sorry we don't have <laughs> we don't have a, a video of that because yeah the time was a little bit short to prepare it and um, yeah but it looks really nice and depending on the color of the slides which are swimming on top of the water um, you you can um, yeah you can verify the thickness so they are in a slight gold shimmer or if they are a little bit reddish you can identify the the thickness if everything is fine and uh, correct. Um, to get the samples or to, to get the slides out of the water, um, yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> you have to have a calm hand, uh, and uh, um, it's uh, yeah very useful. Or we do it like that. We have a stick, and on the top of the stick, there's uh, not a brush, not not so much ha uh, hair like the brush um, you use for painting. It's just one. Um, uh, wimper, <laughs> one hair of your wimpers, and it's just fixed there. And then you go into the water and grab the slide, the section. Um, yeah. Then you mount it on your microscopic slide. You put it on top, and uh, you have to, um, yeah, move it a little bit around so it's not uh, wrinkled, not not wrinkled. It has to be very flat. And um, my experience <laughs> says you need a little bit training to go uh, to be perfect in that. So um, I would say you should start with a, not your real specimen if you didn't do it before. You just use a dummy <laughs> and try to, to produce these slices. And therefore, I would recommend not to use a diamond knife, just use a glass knife. Do your first slides and uh, try to handle it. <laughs> And if you're good in that, <laughs> then you should go for, for this um, yeah, diamond knife with the water and um, yeah, the stick with the wimper and uh, get them out of there. So I like this work very much. So it's a very nice work. You just focus on your sample, you focus on uh, producing these nice slides and you transfer them into um, onto the quartz microscopic slides. So we don't use uh, normal glass slides here. Um, it depends on the on our equipment and the UMSP and the wavelengths we are using. So we don't want to have any interruptions. So we use uh, the quad slides. Um, and if your uh, sections are sitting on top of the slides, you just put them on a heating plate and then they're fixed on the on the glass. So then it's uh, these are these samples are ready to investigate. Yeah, and how does it look like? Here we have uh, the quartz slide. I, have, I, I hope you can see this a little bit. And on top of this, we're here, um, here sitting two, uh, two sections. 
two cross sections of the prepared sample. And this is the way we have to prepare the sample for the UMSP investigation. Yeah, these are the, all the steps before we start. Um, before we start the, the <laughs> microscopic part. This is the equipment you have already seen. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, a, a drawing or another picture. And this is the way it looks like um, at our uh, UMSP lab. And yeah, this, this is the, um, the source for the light. Here we have the computer stage and the screen. So uh, in this um, in this mode, we're gonna work in the uh, with the DOS um, level. So it's a very simple and an effective uh, way to work with. So it's very easy. It's displayed, um, yeah, in a very simple way. Uh, the menu, and uh, there you find every detail you need for the scanning mode. So we have the prepared slices with the uh, sections. So now we have to immerse uh, the section with a drop of uh, non-UV absorbing um, um, glycerin and cover it once more with a quartz cover slip. That is um, um, this we have to use because um, our lens, we put it right on the slide. So we want to protect the, the, the section. And that's why we uh, use um, the immersing uh, oil and uh, use a, a quartz cover slip and once more the oil. So here we see um, the preparation of the sample with the oil. So you have a very thin needle, and here's the oil with the right um, index. And there you get a, uh, put a little drop on top of the um, uh, section. So I think it's pretty hard to see the small section on this, um, on this picture. But um, now we have the drop there. And now the quartz cover slip comes. Uh, you have to have, hold it by a tweezer. You don't have, um, want to have any uh, fingerprints on top of it. Then you can move it a little bit so it um, covers the whole section. After that, you put one drop uh, on the top of uh, the cover slip as well. So we have uh, a direct contact with your lens to the oil and it goes right through, so you don't have any air, which uh, would uh, change uh, your direction of the UV light. So we have, um, yeah, the, the prepared quartz slide, and now we put it into the microscope. So the, the lens will be placed directly on the cover, um, on the cover slip. So we move it to the right lens we want to use, and then we put it on top of it very carefully. So you don't uh, want to break it. And yeah, now you are ready for the microscopic uh, investigation. It's like a microscope. You just uh, have your ocular and your lens and you look through and it looks in this point like uh, just a normal like microscope. And with a tracking ball, you can uh, then um, choose the areas of interest. So now you can uh, start your measurements. And we're going to start with the area scans. As mentioned before, we now uh, have to choose the right wavelengths. For the softwood, we have an absorbance maximum around 280 nanometers. And for the hardwood lignin, at 278. Um, this resolution we mentioned before, so it's a very sensitive and a very high resolution with a very high resolution. And with this steps, we're going to start now to um, start the measurements. Yeah, first we have to um, adjust uh, the, the equipment to have uh, the right um, coefficient. So this you, um, you have to take care that this is not about 
uh, higher than um, 0 0.1. And these, um, yeah, these informations are helpful as well. But uh, this needs to be done to have a reference for the um, for the resin. You don't want to measure the resin. Uh, you want to have uh, uh, let it out from the um, real measurement. So set the origin means that we have a uh, zero point at the, at the, at this uh, x-axis from where the machine automatically starts to scan each field we, um, we uh, choose. Okay, so we now uh, set a new origin and mark and find would be the next step. <clears throat> that means that we define now our rectangular field for the scanning area. I hope it's not too dark because <laughs> when we work with the USP, we don't want to have uh, additional light that disturbs the measurements. So that's why it's pretty dark in here. But now we are um, at the place where we define the areas we want to scan. So uh, we look through the um, microscope and look for the area. And then we press the space bar for the X and for the Y coordinate. So I think in a second, we're gonna see that we have a field. Where's the break? Oh, it goes too fast. <laughs> okay, so here we got the definition, the points where we were gonna measure. And here we have the size of the, <clears throat> of the uh, field we choose. So we have 30 micrometers to 25.75 micrometers. So it's not a too large sized uh, field because we, um, I would like to show the whole process um, because every line will be scanned and uh, for each uh, 0 0.25 micrometer one pixel appears. And so it does not take too long time. Uh, usually we have sizes between 40 to 60 micrometers um, in length and width. Uh, and it takes, yeah, sometimes some hours <laughs> to get to get the, um, the picture afterwards or the information, the measurements. Okay, so let's go further. No, that was too fast. Okay. So we have the, um, the field and now we gonna scan. So now we um, tell uh, the computer that we have and uh, we want to do an automatic scan and we just choose one field. So it means we just have here one and this is the resolution about 0 0.25. And here we go. Here's the scan. On the left side, you have uh, the basic colors and the absorbance intensities um, um, belonging to these colors. And here the scan brings uh, the measurements. Okay, so here we already see some different colors. So it's reddish brown. Here we have some greenish and purple colors. And this area, this was white and bluish. So the first cells appear. I always keep in mind, so each of these small pixels um, gives you an information about 0 0.25 uh, micrometers. So what the absorbance intensity, uh, yeah, one, one, um, one measurement, one uh, is behind each pixel. So you can get very mu um, so much information from the scans. Okay, <clears throat> I make it a little bit faster. Okay, so now it's almost done. Okay, so what do we see here? Uh, on the left side, this is uh, the cell wall of a vessel. And here we have some fibers and parenchyma cells. And um, this white displays an underflow. So that means we have here um, zero absorbance intensities because, oh, you don't see my mouse. Okay, here we go. Um, here's a, a resin, the embedding uh, medium. And here we have the absorbance intensities, um, which belongs to the, uh, which displays uh, the lignin distribution in the cell walls. So this uh, greenish areas show higher absorbances 
about 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. Um, and here are the several corners located. And these bands in purple here round are the middle lamellas, the combined middle lamellas. And the S2 layer, it's a very wide and broad area. It has some a little bit um, changing colors between reddish to brown. And uh, yeah, this depends on the lignin distribution within the S2 layer. And the bluish uh, color uh, gives you the information that you come close to the lumen. Um, how can we now evaluate uh, these uh, scans with this uh, cross in the in the two dimensional picture? We are able to <clears throat> to go to each pixel and get information about the intensity and the absorbance values. So here you see the changes. If you move your cross, you get different uh, intensities and absorbance values. So you can go exactly to an area you are interested in. And if you want to have more information, then you go right to the evaluation menu. And here you have the possibility uh, to look at the histogram. So you want to have a nice Gauss curve here and uh, a good um, distribution of your uh, measurements. And then here we have the great opportunity to depict this two-dimensional picture uh, and convert it into a 3D uh, area profile. Uh, in this view, we have here um, the vessel and look into this uh, cell right behind in here. And here, these nice uh, hills <laughs> and tops, these are the several corners. And here we got the middle lamella as well. And uh, yeah, the lumina is very um, in the depth. In the, uh, and now we can change the view from this direction into the upper side direction. So we turn it a little bit. And this is very helpful because sometimes you want to look right into a different area, not in this or this, for example. Then it's help, very helpful to uh, change it a little bit, uh, this three dimensional, to, to turn it and to have another view on your um, sample. So, yeah, it's a very nice topographical um, illumination of the lignin distribution. So it's uh, yeah absolutely clear where the highest amount is located. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, good to see. So what else can we do? These are the three-dimensional um, pictures. Okay, yeah. Here you can uh, change your classes, for example. Uh, I usually have uh, 14 classes from the different colors here, uh, but you also can have uh, 56. So, uh, and you can change between intensity and absorbance and yeah, get information about the thresholds and the min and maximum absorbance intensities. One nice feature is also that we have again this cross in the two dimensional um, picture. And this displays you um, a cut through the uh, cells, through the cells, and you can uh, look into the um, contours like a, um, yeah, a line cut. And the topography we saw in the three-dimensional picture, we now have an, uh, a direct uh, direct view into the cell walls. So that means the cross is right here close to the lumina. Here we see the lumina of the fiber. Here's the lumina of the vessel. And this area um, displays the middle lamella as well as here. It's located in this uh, place. Um, you see also the field length. So you have the exact um, place where it's located. So it's something between 20 to 30 micrometers in this area. And on the y-axis, we have the absorbance intensities. Uh, yeah. And if you go through, you have a nice profile that moves uh, depending on your cross you have here. So here you have this high peak from the silver corner on this side. And now we move it a little bit downwards. And we have the big S2 layer in this area. 
and then we come close again to the to the um, to the several corners of this uh, area. So um, it's a very nice tool, uh, not only for the lignin distribution. Also, um, I used it uh, my PhD work for the distribution of the fufugyl alcohol. Uh, inside the wood cell walls and then it's inside the modified uh, cell walls and you have um, you can display really nice uh, the information of the cell walls and uh, yeah in a really nice way okay this is just uh, a view into the possibilities of the evaluation menu um, with the next slides I will present you some um, yeah, results. So, my <clears throat> I'm sorry. In my um, thesis uh, in 2010, I investigated um, Grappa guyonensis. Where's okay? Yeah, water locked uh, Grappa guyonensis. So this came. Uh, this um, wood material came from the Panama can Canal, and the species was Grappa guyonensis. It's also known as uh, Andiruba. And um, yeah. So for 100 years, the wood was uh, underneath the water and it's locked. And uh, yeah, the, the guys who want to uh, mark uh, to uh, sell the wood, they wanted to know what's, um, if the wood tissue is still uh, in good condition and did something change with the wood tissue. And yeah, so in my thesis, I. Um, yeah, I had the chance to investigate uh, the, the wood properties, the mechanical, physical, and as well the topochemical uh, um, analysis. So here we have on the right side the light microscopic uh, cross section. We have the big vessels, the fiber tissue, and this is a picture from the ground tissue. And yeah, we found out that the, the lignin distribution, everything is fine, nothing uh, is degraded and nothing uh, is uh, during the age time, um, uh, during the age um, changed. So we have here the high peaks of the silver corners and uh, the lumina and the distribution within the S2 layer. Um, what else did we have a look on? We looked also on the, on the rape cells and the parenchyma and the parenchyma cells are filled up uh, by this uh, extractors and composites yeah so this were the two pictures i want to show you from this waterlogged um, wood species we um, we investigated and here's uh, another um, example for um, um, for wood tissue that was analyzed by uh, Riewan um, and Koch uh, during this, it's his PhD work. And here there was the focus on early signs of decay in the wood uh, cell walls. Um, here we have uh, Pinus silvestris and the absorbance intensity um, was about uh, 280 nanometers. And with this sensitive technique, it was able to localize several uh, changes within the cell wall uh, and these changes depend on the fungi. So this is, was a very nice and interesting project to see um, how early degradation happens in the wood cell wall. Here we have a uh, brown rod fungi and the brown fungi uh, is known to be very <laughs> very bad. He uh, um, causes um, really hard construction uh, failure in a short time. So it's possible just after a short incubation that you have already some signs of this uh, degradation process, which is uh, dri driven by the brown rod fungi. What else? So <laughs> in my PhD work, I, I had a look at FA modified wood. So the fulfur alcohol was um, was impregnated, I'm sorry, <laughs> impregnated in the uh, radiata pine. And uh, this is a picture of untreated uh, a radiata pine and here on the right side we have a clear increase of absorbance intensities uh, after the modification. I looked at several modifications so this is the first one so one kind of the modification done uh, with fufuryl alcohol and we see that the fufuryl alcohol polymerizes in the cell wall and changes the lignin absorbance it changes the um, absorbances at all. 
And this is uh, an indication for an intensive modification process. <clears throat> Um, yeah, this was the um, the examples for the um, GMSP area scans. Now I would like to introduce uh, point measurements. Here we use uh, um, changing wavelengths, so we have a, a, a wavelength between 240 and 700 nanometers, and the size of a measurement point is about one micrometer. So this means we are also able to look at the middle lamella. So not only the S2 layer or, or small points at um, the outermost parts are able to, we are able to look at, so also the middle lamella is interesting for us. Uh, here I'm going to start with the equipment as well. We have also the UMSP80 here uh, level and we choose uh, the device, what we want to do and select the method. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty easy to to uh, uh, set the the, um, the equipment and the first thing we want to do is let's see where it comes. We have to change a, a little bit uh, of the parameters to adjust it and to say in which range we want to have uh, the recording at this uh, point measurement. So the first thing we have to adjust uh, the equipment. And after that, we can, yeah, okay, we have to check first um, the, the values, if everything went well, otherwise we have to repeat it. And in the next step, step we are gonna look at the, at the wavelengths. And we have 240 uh, to 500 nanometers. And then we have to, of course, uh, le um, let the computer know um, what is the name of the sample and where we want to have uh, to store it and give them uh, a number. And then it counts automatically from one to the next uh, thing. Okay. But this is just, uh, yeah, for all data we want to save, we have to reserve the right path and uh, make sure that the specimen gets the right number and uh, so you can find it afterwards. We need the, um, the first, this um, first line and it takes some time and here it goes. And so this is a uh, this is then recorded and uh, belongs to the next method me measurements. And this is a standard spectrum uh, and it just has to be saved and to be done before every uh, single point measurement. So before you use the next point, you have to do it uh, once more to make sure that you get the right values. Yeah, now it starts to, to record um, the, the measurement. Here we have 280 and here the maximum already reached and then it goes a little bit downwards and here again and this is uh, a normal spectrum for a fiber I would say. Here we have very high absorbance intensities around one, uh, 1.4 and this should be, let's see what we have. Uh, silver corner, I would say. And then we're gonna start the next one. Okay, this is also maybe S2 layer, lower absorbance intensities. And it's a typical lignine, um, lignine uh, curve. So this was the S2 layer and the higher absorbance intensities that was uh, the before. We have something about this. Uh, I saw it was described as uh, the extractives of, um, of parenchyma cells. You really have high absorbance intensities. 
the several corners should be located a little bit deeper and we have a slight shoulder, shoulder um, close to the visible range between 200, 320 and 360 and this gives you um, some information about the uh, uh, chromophoric groups in the um, extractives. Yeah, so these curves are looking all different depending on where you measure it. So this was the S2 layer with uh, lower uh, information, uh, lower absorbance intensities. Okay, these were the little short movies. And here we have a nice picture where we um, bring these curves together. Uh, here I choose again my uh, the Garapaguanensis from the Panama Canal. And here you have the different colors for the fiber for the S2 and the combined middle amela of a fiber and the purple one is a vessel. And here you have we have the absorbance intensities um, of the maximum of lignin. It's here around 278. So each cell wall layer displays uh, the absorbance intensities in this area. And uh, here we see the the um, higher values depending on the location. If we have a cell wall corner, here we have a vessel. This is the combined middle lamella of a fiber and here we have the S2 layer. So depending on the concentration of the S, oh, you didn't see my pointer, I'm sorry. And depending on the, on the kind of cell wall and layer we look at, we have different uh, intensities depending on the, um, on the lignin concentration. And uh, we don't have any uh, strange uh, shoulders or strange um, changes in this area. So we can say that after 100 years in the Panama Canal, nothing happened to the tissue. It's just as normal as you would uh, get the um, wood from the forest. Uh, one uh, quick look, a look at my um, modified wood. <laughs> So um, you also can measure uh, the uh, polymerase fufuryl alcohol in the cell lumen. So that means the, the polymerization um, resin, it goes not only into the cell wall, it stays also in the lumen. And here I got this curve. I choose uh, a wavelength range between 240 and 600 nanometers. And I get a uh, absorbance maximum around 280 and here a very high and uh, defined shoulder. And on the right side you see the secondary cell wall where we have the untreated uh, curve. We have with lower intensities at the maximum and a, a clearly a higher shift to higher absorbance intensities for the whole cell wall, uh, cell wall layer S2 with a yeah, um, inf interesting shoulder at this area. So here we have the emotions in this area. And um, yeah, this um, findings show us that we have a high, higher con uh, con condensation of carbonyl groups. And this gives us information or a hint to the FA reaction with the GUI2 units of the softwood lignin. So, yeah, that was a very interesting finding because um, in the um, in 2008 uh, they found out in uh, in vitro that uh, lignin and FA uh, are uh, you are want to bind together, so they are affin and want to bind together. But nobody uh, showed this that it would also happen in the in the wood itself. So the wood cell or lignin, not only a model. And with this, we clearly show that we have a reaction between the wood, wood lignin and the fulfill alcohol that goes into the wood tissue. Yeah, in the next step, we look at the lesser used wood species in our, from our project. And as I mentioned, um, at our institute, we had a project that deals with Frobinia psoria acacia. Uh, with black locust and here um, I present you the paper from Oliver Dünisch, Hans-Georg Richter and Gerald Koch. So this it's published in the Wood Science and Technology Journal in 2010. And uh, this paper had the, the aim that they wanted to um, investigate the content and the chemical distribution 
of phenolic compounds and other wood extractors. Um, this is something yeah, you can do with uh, the wood, but in this case it's uh, interesting because um, the black locust develops a part in the inner part that is uh, called germinal wood. Um, it's about yeah, 10 to 20 hearings, I would say. And uh, here they want to compare these um, properties with the major hardwood. Because this is very important to know what kind of properties uh, this um, has um, in, the, um, in the wood use. Uh, because you can't say, okay, the major wood and the juvenile wood, um, they have the same properties if you don't check us. this. So in the investigations, we carry out with special focus on the resistance of hardwood against fungal decay. So they are interested in if the juvenile wood and the entire hardwood is, uh, has the same uh, natural durability against degrading fungi. Um, what method are used for this uh, um, project? Um, there's a big chemical part, of course. So they used uh, the TAPI procedure. It's known from the pulp and paper production to determine class and lignin. And this uh, it was quantified by the, um, by the photometric uh, equipment around uh, with a nanometers of 205 nanometers. Um, the extraction was carried out with acetone water, water uh, in a, a condition from 9 to 1, and also methanol water. And of course, the human speed technique were used for the topic chemical investigations. And the decay test was performed with a brown rod and a, a white rod. So the white rod is colorless vesicular, and the brown rod is conophyopodina. These are two standard fungi uh, for the, yeah, to find out uh, which class of natural durability um, this material has. Uh, and let's have a look at the results. So this paper um, has a lot of more information, of course, um, which can, um, which uh, can be, uh, read in, in the whole paper. I just want to present a few things um, regarding the UMSP technique. So um, with the um, point measurements, uh, they look at the cellular distribution of lignin and phenolic extractors. Here we have three uh, diagrams. The first one displays a vessel. The second one we have uh, axial parenchyma. And the last one is the fiber. So the parenchyma um, has a little bit, uh, so from the highest absorbance intensities, we have the vessel, then the parenchyma and the um, fiber. So it, uh, it um, has lower absorbance intensities around the maximum. The maximum is here already. Um, or, uh, located at 270 nanometers because we have a hardwood. So the maximum is at 278. And here we get these nice uh, peaks on the curves. Um, in these pictures or in these graphs, you have the open circle, uh, circles for the sapwood and you have the filled circles, circles for the hardwood, as um, for the hardwood or for the inner part of the. Um, Robinia pseudo acacia. <laughs> so when we look at the vessel, um, uh, or at or at all three, you see that uh, the hardwood has always higher absorbance intensities in the whole spectrum. That means that we have something else located in the cell walls. That uh, little shoulder in this area gives you uh, gives us information that we have chromophoric groups. Um, and extractives which are impregnated into the cell wall. So they are not um, right in the lumina, but they are impregnated. And when we look at the sap wood, this is the curve underneath in all three cases. We have clear lower intensities uh, during the spectrum and we don't have these shoulders in this uh, area. So that means we don't have any changes or anything that 
um, improves the natural durability. So just the hardwood gives uh, us the information that there is something that improves the natural durability. Um, yeah, here the results are just in a <laughs> text form. So uh, samples of vessel and exile Heimer of a juvenile hardwood had lower UV absorbance intensities in this area, 240 to 400, uh, compared to the walls of the hardwood. So that's clear. So the major wood has um, higher absorbances, and this is um, um, this is based on the um, um, location of flavonoids, uh, which are deposited in the cell walls itself. Um, yeah, yeah, and the maximum is a little bit lower as well. So when we now have a look at the um, area scans of this um, of this uh, investigated uh, black locust, we have on the left side the juvenile, and on the right side the ma major hardwood of the stem, and. Um, the absorbance uh, scales are given on the left side, as we saw it for the other uh, analysis. So we have 14 basic colors. And um, when we look at this side, we, ha we have some, some uh, lower, uh, lower absorbance intensities, where here we have clearly located close to the vessel, higher absorbance intensities. Uh, as we saw this in the point measurements with the parenchyma cells. So here are the extractives located, um, which gives uh, yeah, which gives a uh, higher durability for the major hardwood. F is the fiber, so this is the lumina of a fiber. And yeah, so this um, um, this UMSP investigation. Um, um, underlines the information from the chemical analysis. analysis. So that means that we have juvenile hardwood uh, of uh, black locos with, uh, with lower durabilities than the major hardwood. It uh, was seen in the, in the um, absorbance intensity as well as in the fungi, the fungal test. And uh, the topochemical topo tests also indicate that um, the lower content of phenolic compounds and flavonoids in the juvenile hardwood is the main reason for this lower dur durability. So this is the quintessent from this uh, investigation that we have, um, um, which uh, grows in the um, decades between 10 to 20 years. And uh, yeah, we have to take care of this part in the center of uh, the stem. And we have to know that we have a lower natural durability and the use of uh, this wood species. A very nice afternoon. And um, at first, I uh, thank you for the invitation to, to speak here and to present the uh, topics of chemical analysis of several components of wood species and lesser known wood species. And at first, I want to introduce myself. My name is John Abbott. I'm a um, researcher at the Thun Institute uh, for six years on the um, research area bio-based resources and products. And I present the working group of thermochemical analysis. And so this is the topic uh, which we uh, work on uh, analysis of uh, wood components and the uh, um, usability of these wood components for, for example, uh, polymers for monomers and other utilizations. So at first, I want to give you a short outline. What I want to present today is that yeah, it's very familiar for you. Um, I will give you a short overview about the several components and the separation methods. This is very necessary for our work to analyze these uh, single components. Then um, I will give you an overview of some possible chemical analysis methods. And then I will focus on the chromatography methods. Uh, in this case, the liquid and the gas chromatography of um, several components. 
And then I want to talk about some principles and I'll give you some examples for sample preparation for measurements for data evaluation. And I will present you some results which we um, get in the last years about the work on these um, topics. And then afterwards, um, as, as a short, in a short manner, I will give you a comparison of gas and liquid chromatography and will present you some advantages and disadvantages of these two techniques. At first, um, we will come to, to um, the um, several components you will notice uh, in which we have uh, three or four main topics. These are the cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And then we will find uh, some extractives uh, as a secondary uh, plant product. And I'm waiting for a cup search for the laser pointer. And for our work, um, it is we are interested in the structure and analysis of structure of these three and four components about the uh, linear uh, polymer of cellulose and the some coarse polymer of the hemicellulose and the three-dimensional network of the lignin. And besides this, um, for our work and for the identification of what components, it is uh, very interesting to look at the extractives as the secondary plant uh, products. Um, they give, uh, so to say, a little fingerprint of each uh, wood species. But um, if at first, if you come to our um, interesting uh, structures, it is necessary to separate these structures from the wood sample because um, it is not possible to uh, analyze these uh, materials in their own um, structure. It is necessary to separate this. So um, we can do this with um, different uh, chemical conversion methods. Um, these are, for example, um, pulp methods or methods to um, produce some lignin fractions from, from the um, wood biomass. And the second stage, if we come from the biomass by chemical conversion, then we get some fractions of our raw material. This is enriched with cellulose and fibers on one hand, or it's enriched on lignin on the other hand. And with a third method, it is possible to extract um, these secondary plant products, these uh, so-called extractives, by um, solvent extraction or by supercritical solvent extractions. And with these four components, we can do analysis and we can get some information about the uh, structures. And with this combination of this information of the structure, we can get some ideas from the origin of these uh, structures or on the wood species. And with these methods, um, it's possible to produce some polymers on one hand. Um, these polymers, we can uh, analyze this with uh, different methods like um, spectroscopy, like quantigraphy or other methods. And uh, on the second hand, it is possible to produce some monomers from our um, reactions or from our biomass, and we can analyze these monomers and conclude uh, regarding the structure of the monomers to the um, overall three-dimensional structure of our wood sample material. And this uh, picture will show you a short selection of the possible um, analysis analysis methods on um, biomass and biomass fractions. And there are four um, topics and, and which we are um, working here on the uh, Tuning Institute. On the left side, you have some chemical analysis methods. This is necessary to um, estimate the lignin content of some fractions of the biomass to do some uh, wet chemical analysis like um, methoxyl groups estimation to estimate the uh, C900 formula of such lignin fractions and to estimate uh, the elemental 
contents, uh, the organic ele elemental contents. This is made on the chemical analysis. If we use uh, some uh, temperature, then we can make uh, some thermal analysis methods uh, like the estimation of the ash content, the estimation of the inorganic content to um, estimate the thermal behavior of some polymers inside a specific atmosphere. And we can um, learn something about the polymeric structures of um, the components. We can learn about the thermal behavior with DSC differential scanning calorimetry. And if you want to um, know something about the structure of some unknown compounds or unknown stru uh, structures, it is possible to decompose the uh, three-dimensional network into low molecular weight components. And with analysis of these low molecular weight components, you can do this by analytical um, pyrolysis, GCMS. And with this analysis of the, uh, the low molecular weight components, we can have an idea about the composed structure before pyrolysis. And on the right side, you have uh, some typical uh, methods of spectroscopy and chromatography. And in spectroscopy, it's the NMR spectroscopy, the um, FTIR spectroscopy, and the um, UV VIS spectroscopy. These are also uh, methods um, for uh, to get information about the molecular structure of uh, the uh, unknown components. And with chromatography, it is possible to um, separate um, heterogeneous compounds from our biomass fractions into single compounds. And with the analysis of the, um, the, quant the quantity and the quality of these components, it is possible to um, conclude on the overall structure of the biomass fractions. This is also a choice of the uh, uh, methods which we um, work on the uh, Twin Institute and here and working in Boswell. And now uh, in the next slides, I want to give you a short overview about the main principles of um, chromatography. And then um, I will come to some um, um, facilities of chromatography and uh, how working this and what are the main results which we do this. Okay, um, at first, if you come to a definition of chromatography, then it's a very old one. It is from the, um, the beginning of the 20th century and chromatography is a composed word of two old Greek words. It's the uh, first one is chroma, and this is uh, means um, color. And then we have the second word is graphene, which it means writing. So it's it is it's a composed word. Then we have it's a color writing, and this means uh, the first um, chromatography was a separation of uh, um, color plant components, uh, which is done by. Um, a Russian um, researcher, it's called uh, Svet, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And then you see here on the right side, you see a picture of the apparatus which he used for uh, a simultaneous uh, separation of different um, components, of different mixtures of components. And then you see here on the, uh, under the label B, and larger um, apparatus for the separation of um, large amounts of uh, plant products. And what does quantography mean? It's, uh, it's the separation of compound mixtures by different distribution of single compounds between a stationary and a mobile phase. Yeah, we have two phases, and uh, between these two phases, we have some interactions, and uh, considering these interactions, it in the direction it is possible to separate a uh, compound mixture into single compounds, and then you need a detection mode. And here, um, Svet um, analyze or separate the um, typical um, chlorophyll pigment in uh, plant leaves, and they find out that we have uh, 
uh, we have five attractions, five different color attractions on our uh, green chlorophyll in our green plants. What is the main principle? Um, the main principle is the separation of uh, this compound mixture um, on a stationary phase. And uh, we use a mobile phase to bring our um, compound mixture in solution on our stationary phase. And you find this here in the first picture. This is our um, compound mixture in solution. And it is necessary to bring uh, this uh, solution into this uh, adsorption material, this stationary phase. This is a porous material which absorbs these um, single components, like uh, you find this on this uh, the second picture here. We have a small layer on our um, stationary phase. On this layer, uh, we have the absorption of our uh, components of our single components in the mixture. And then uh, we can introduce some washing steps uh, to um, reduce some interactions between these components in the stationary phase or to uh, clean these um, stationary phase from impurities. Or uh, the third uh, possibility is to uh, make a condition of these stationary phase in preparation for uh, new introduction of um, a sample mixture. But um, if we want to start a separation on the stationary phase, then it is necessary to bring um, a mobile phase on the stationary phase, which is uh, uh, which is suitable for the um, solution of the single components and this washing down from our stationary phase. This is the main principle. And you can see this here. We um, start with a um, uh, suitable solvent. This can be a single solvent or this can be a solvent mixture. And then if we add the solvent to the stationary phase, and the solvent goes through the stationary phase, then it's possible to solute the first single components and to work it down from our stationary phase. And we can do this uh, again and again with one uh, solvent, or we can change the solvent, but it's also possible to do this with one solvent, and then we can um, work down these, these components at several times. And then um, if we separate these, um, this output here with the silicon components, then we, we can get different fractions. And if we analyze these different fractions, then it's possible to uh, get some single fractions with single components. And this is more or less uh, the main principle of typical liquid chromatography. And you find this as a typical column uh, liquid chromatography in the lab, or you can also find this as application for cleaning of complex mixtures by solid phase extraction. If we turn um, this principle to 90 degree in uh, horizontal state, then you, we can um, have an idea about the orientation and about the uh, principles on the gas chromatography. The principle is near the same. We have a stationary phase and we have a mobile phase, not on a glass column. We have this on a few steel car column with a very small diameter in the next um, pictures, uh, next slides, I'll show you a picture of these um, few silica columns. But um, instead of using a solvent as mobile phase, we're using a gas as mobile phase. This is so-called a carrier gas, and we use um, normally um, helium or uh, nitrogen as an inert um, gas atmosphere. It's also possible to use um, hydrogen as a mobile phase for a gas chromatography. The principle is the same. We have here at the beginning our uh, mixture in solution 
of our um, compounds. And um, the first step is introducing uh, these mixture into the stationary phase. On a typical fused silica column, the stationary phase is not a more or less porous um, solid. It's a high viscous um, liquid and which is laying on the inside of our very small fused silica. And on this liquid, the, um, we bring these um, substances into this liquid and then we heated this column by a specific temperature broken. And according to the boiling point and according to the interactions of these compounds between the stationary phase, it is possible that um, some compounds can release these stationary phase into the mobile phase. And then with the uh, stream of our um, mobile phase, it is possible to separate these components from each other. You see here, this is the green uh, circle starts first. Then we find the red squares here on the mobile phase. And with uh, further heating, we have a transportation in, uh, in the in this direction. And then with further heating and further heating and further heating, then uh, we will bring out all our uh, components into the mobile phase, but separated from each other. And now on the right side of this column, you find a detection unit. And the detection unit detects all of these uh, components. And uh, the intensity, gives us an idea about the abundance of uh, these uh, components. And you find this here on the typical chromatogram. column. On the x-axis, you have the time uh, starting by the introduction of the uh, sample into the stationary phase. And on the epsilon axis, you have the abundance of these uh, components. And you find here we have, um, we have four components on our single mi uh, our compound mixture. And we have here um, four peaks of our um, separated uh, single components and the height or the, um, the area of the peaks give us an idea about the intensity of the signal and the amount of these uh, single components on our uh, component mixture. And um, the separation um, supports by some processes like adsorption on the stationary phase between these uh, components in the mixture. We have a dispersion inside this uh, stationary phase and a dispersion on the mobile phase. And another interaction it is necessary for the retention of uh, some components is are the interaction of the single components to the stationary phase by weak van der Waals bonds. And if the, these weak van der Waals bonds are too strong, or we have too many weak van der Waals bonds, then it is possible that a um, component can um, remain on the stationary phase and cannot uh, leave these stationary phase to the mobile phase and can be separated and detected on the detection unit. But normally, all these processes are reversible um, to for a good separation. But if we have some irreversible processes, then we have uh, some impurities on our stationary phase. And then um, after a time, it's necessary to clean uh, this phase by a specific uh, temperature program. Or uh, this, the other way is to cut this uh, column here on this side, and then you use a shorter column. Then if you use a shorter column, it's necessary to adjust the retention times of your interesting components. So these are more or less the main principles in a short manner on uh, chromatography, gas chromatography, or liquid chromatography. It's more or less the same. And now and I want to uh, give you an overview about the classification of some um, techniques, of some methods, and um, how we can classify this by uh, different 
um, parameters. The first one is the mobile phase, and this is the um, part which is moving through the um, stationary phase, and it's uh, transported the uh, single components from the, uh, the side of liberation to the detection system. And if we use gas or liquid chromatography, then we have a mobile phase, mobile phase which are gases or liquids. In a third uh, possibility, it's possible to use um, supercritical fluids as a specific um, part or a mixture of liquid and gas chromatography, because uh, supercritical fluids are um, characterized as a mixture of gas and liquid state. It's not possible to change this state by some uh, critical conditions. Then uh, we can um, separate it by the stationary phase. It's, um, we can use an absorption material uh, like um, silica gel or other um, chemical, more or less chemical inert compounds. Um, then um, some bonded phases exist. We have some gels on uh, the separation um, sites, or we can also use some resins which are produced um, for the um, separation of typical mixtures or for the separation of some specific um, problems. Then um, we can separate it by uh, the performance. Um, normally, um, the performance is made by a column, but uh, on different uh, topics, you find some planar performance like thin layer chromatography, then you have a blade. Uh, on which we can make the separation. Um, and these are the same principles like the separation on a certain column. And uh, with combination of all these um, uh, parameters and possibilities, we find our different types of chromatography. These are a choice of uh, different types which are, exist uh, to um, carry out some uh, chromatography. And I will focus today on these both um, methods and these both techniques. This is uh, gas liquid chromatography. It's normally known as GZ, as uh, gas chromatography. And um, then I will uh, present you something about liquid solid chromatography. And this is uh, the, uh, it's normally known as HPLC as high performance liquid chromatography. So now at the next slide, I will give you a short overview about um, uh, gas, gas chromatography. And at, at first, um, I will um, tell you something about a general layout of a typical gas chromatography apparatus. You find here on the right side, a typical scheme of the uh, gas chromatography system with four important, uh, five important units. And on the mid side, you have a picture of our, one of our uh, uh, GCMS FID systems. And the important thing or the important part of the uh, GC system is this one here. It's called number three. This is uh, the GC oven with the inside column, the inside separation column, and here uh, the separation of our uh, product mixtures carries out. The um, compound mixture is introduced by a microliter syringe uh, and an injector, which is fine on this system. This is number two. And we have different injection systems. We have cold injection, we have hot injection systems, we have on column injection systems. There are several types for more or less each problem. We have an own injection system. So um, for some standard uh, analysis or standard um, work, it is. Um, necessary to have one injection system which works very good, which is uh, more or less a standard or a state of the art um, system. But if you have more experimental um, work, then you can uh, choose um, non-usual um, injection systems to separate um, 
special component mixtures without any discrimination, without any uh, losses of uh, heavy components and so on. And then after this evaluation, it is necessary to get information about the abundance of the and the intensity of the components. And you can uh, make this by detection system. And the, the usual and common detection systems are an FID detection system. This is a flame ionization detection. MS mass spectrometry, it's also common. And then the other um, common detector is a TCD. This is a <coughs> thermal conductivity detector. And it's possible with this detector to measure um, some samples without any carbon content. And then on a data evaluation system, uh, uh, you can construct your chronogram and find the information um, which are calculated from the single um, results. And now on the uh, left side, you find some impressions of a um, typical uh, column system. You have here a picture about a uh, more or less older system. These are some typical uh, packed columns. These columns are made of steel or here made of copper. And these columns are filled with um, solid porous um, material. And the separation is done on this material by a solid gas -o. Uh, quantography. Now, the usual way um, today is to use a um, uh, capillary uh, column. And this capillary column, you find a, a picture here, is made of a very thin um, fluid silica column. And on the inside of this column, this is filled with um, film of um, polymer. And this you can uh, adjust this polymer for your uh, sample or for your separation problem. And the polymer is made by a siloxane network with uh, some introduced functional groups. And uh, with these introduced functional groups, it is possible to modify the properties of this uh, small uh, film inside this column. And with this modification of the film, you can adjust, you can enhance the separation from your different uh, single components in your component mixture. Um, now a, a few words about these important units, uh, about the uh, gas chromatography. We have three important units. These are uh, the injector system, the column, in brackets, the oven, and the detector system. With the injector system, uh, you inject the uh, solute sample material to your uh, column. And the gas chromatography, it is necessary that uh, this um, sample system or sample solution is generally vaporized at certain temperature. This is uh, the crucial point for uh, gas chromatography. And this vaporized uh, sample is uh, transporting by the carrier gas to um, the column for separation. And, and as I mentioned before, there are some different types of injector systems. Uh, there are split and splitless injector systems, cold and hot needle injection mode. You can use this. You can use this uh, as an on column uh, system, or you can use this uh, with a vaporizing chamber, like here on this picture. And this is a general scheme of a typical injector. You have here at the top, you have a, bot, a, a setter. And on you introduce your um, compounds by a syringe to the septum into the vaporizing chamber. This is heated uh, to a certain temperature. And here on this uh, chamber, you have uh, uh, online vaporization of your sample material. And with the carrier gas, it comes from here. Uh, the sample material is transporting to your column. And if you use a uh, splitless, or if you use a split injector, then it's possible to divide these um, whole vapor into two fractions. The uh, smaller fraction of the vapor is uh, uh, transported to the column, and the, the rest of the vapor is um, it's purged by a different gas stream. And these um, splitless, uh, split injection um, 
guarantees uh, finer and uh, efficient selectivity of our measurements because um, it is possible to introduce very small quantities um, of your um, sample material to the column and then you can have a better separation to this uh, work uh, in the column and then you can uh, have a better results. Yeah, um, on the column you um, uh, mentioned, they have a packed column system or they have uh, this fused silica system. And the success of separation depends on the material inside these column systems, the thickness of these uh, film, the diameter of the whole column, and uh, about the temperature broken, about the gas type of the carrier gas, the velocity of the gas type, the viscosity of the gas type. And it's very important, a complete vaporization of your sample into the injection chamber. And uh, last but not least, the detector system, it's collecting the signals and transferring the signals to your data um, evaluation system. And we have more or less two types of detectors. These are uh, destructive and non-destructive detectors. Destructive detectors um, destroy our sample and get the information from the destroyed sample. These are the flame ionization detector and the mass spectrometry are more or less typical um, destructive detectors and non-destructive detectors are the TCD detector or the NPD detector for nitrogen uh, components. And uh, with, if you use this non-destructive detector, then it's possible to couple different detector systems. And at the first detection system, you need a non-destructive detector system, and then you can use a second detector system, a destructive detector system. So that you have uh, a coupling of two different systems for detection of organic uh, components. And the aim is to enhance the uh, depth of information and to enhance selectivity of uh, your um, separation procedure. And you see here, this is a um, scheme of a typical FID uh, detector. You have here the column um, with your um, sample material. And this col column is introducing about this channel. And on this channel, this comes the, um, the burning gas. And now here on the top of the of these nozzle, the um, uh, hydrogen flame is burned, and in this flame, uh, the uh, carbons of your sample material burns. And with this burning of the carbon species, then we introduce in an electric field on this uh, collector system, and we introduce a changement of an, a certain electric field, and this changement can be measured as a signal and can be calculated as a typical peak on our data processing system. So these are more or less an overview about the main principles of uh, the gas chromatography system. And now um, I will give you a short impression of a typical strategy, how we come from our unknown sample to a certain uh, result from uh, gas chromatography. At first, um, it is necessary to, um, to think about the questions of sample choice and probation of the sample. Um, this is very, this is necessary. Then um, it is important to choose the equipment or to adjust to your equipment to your uh, separation problem and to build a method. And after this, um, it's necessary to um, think about the data evaluation, what can I do with my results and what can I do with my calculated results and what for um, further calculation can I carry out. And at first it is necessary that our sample material is soluble in common solvents um, with the exception of Pyrolysis GCMS is another topic, but in general, it is necessary that we have a good solubility of our sample material in common solvents like ethanol, like acetone, like tetrahydrofurane, or other organic solvents. And this is necessary for vaporizing at the injector chamber. 
And besides the vaporizing, it is necessary that we have a repeatable vaporization of our um, systems, of our uh, component mixture on our injection chamber. And uh, if you use some detectors like um, FID, it is necessary that our uh, component mixtures contains uh, carbon. Um, if we have uh, some uh, components or some samples with a, a minor uh, carbon content, then it's not possible to um, analyze these uh, sample with a flame immunization detector. Then you have to use a mass spectrometry or you have to use a TCD detector. And the last step is that it is necessary to think about the preparation of our solution. Uh, you can add an internal standard for uh, quantification of your uh, interesting substances. Then it is necessary to filtrate your systems uh, because particles are not good at your um, injection chamber because this falls down on the injection chamber and um, disturbs the further um, vaporization of um, the next um, mixtures which you want to analyze. Okay, now then equipment and method. Um, this method and then our equipment is has been adapted for the assembly material or for the solution which you want to analyze. Um, this means that we have uh, we want to use a suitable injector system, uh, which uh, corresponds to the, this type, to this volume on our uh, separation problem. Then we have to adjust a certain temperature for vaporized our uh, mixture. And then we can uh, to choose the um, split or splitless mode for um, mixtures which are high concentrated, then we want to use a split mode, or if we have a low concentrated mixtures, then we use a splitless mode to increase the, um, the, uh, the number of signals on our detector system. Then we uh, think about the column, more or less we use a fused silica um, column, a pack column, this is more or less a special case for some um, single um, measurements, but on, it's common to use some fused silica um, wheel columns. And then we have to choose the film and the solvent material, which we have to adjust for our separation problem. And then it is uh, necessary to think about the thickness and the four dimensions if we use a uh, porous um, adsorption material on our column systems. It is also possible to use a fused silica um, wheel column with an um, porous solid uh, in, inlay of our uh, column system. Then um, we have to think about a temperature program uh, to bring out the uh, compounds uh, from the stationary phase to the mobile phase and to separate it. Then um, it is necessary to think about the carrier gas, to the velocity of the carrier gas, and some other auxiliaries um, which we need for a, a good and precise um, separation on the GCMS system. And last but not least, um, it's what for a detector can I use for this system? And here is also necessary to think about the type. Um, if I use an FID, if I use an MS and TCD, and how can I transfer um, these um, vaporized mixtures from the column to the detection system? It is necessary to heat this transfer line, uh, for example, by an MS detection. Or uh, if I need additional gases um, like um, nitrogen or like hydrogen uh, to, to use a uh, flame immunization detector. Or, and then it is necessary to think about the rate of recording and these affect the quality of your uh, results and your photogram. And then um, uh, last but not least, and there are some special ideas about the data evaluation. We have two kinds for typical data evaluation. Uh, this is a non-target analysis, uh, this is more like a screening, uh, what, uh, what four compounds I have on my uh, mixture, or 
we um, carry out in target analysis. So that we look for special um, compounds uh, in our mixture and to estimate the uh, quantity of these uh, target uh, uh, analyticals. And um, if we carry out an external or internal calibration, uh, then we can um, carry out a quantitative analysis besides a qualitative analysis. On the qualitative analysis, uh, we know what is in my mixture. And on the quantitative analysis, how, how much is the content of um, our uh, single components on the uh, mixture. And then um, it is necessary to do some efforts in the quality management. Um, have I uh, precise data? Have I reproducible data? And it is possible to compare this data with other measurements um, which done before on the system. So now I want to uh, show you some examples um, of typical gas chromatography um, problems on our uh, labs, on our, um, in our research work. And I want to uh, begin with uh, the analysis of some liquid samples here. And we start with some wood extractives and uh, we carry out uh, the extraction of some uh, typical European uh, wood species like spruce, Douglas fir, beech, oak, and birch. And we carry out an extraction with a typical um, solid liquid extraction procedure with acetone water, a mixture of acetone water, petroleum ether. And uh, for the birch samples, we use a ternary system of an ethanol, a fuel acetate, and water to um, extract the uh, typical components from uh, the wood and the bark of the systems. And we carry out these extraction with uh, accelerated solvent extraction systems. You can find this here. This is an automated system uh, under pressure, which you can use for um, some extractions or some sequences of extractions and at a medium quantity of samples. And you can uh, choose here on these on these bottles. You can choose your um, solvent systems. And the extraction is done automatically by this um, uh, machine. And afterwards, it is possible to uh, separate the, ex the extracts and the residues from the system. And then um, you can use this extracts for your analyzation. What we have done is that we um, carry out a GCMS IPD measurement with an on column injection and a split injection for the Douglas fur and the spruce uh, samples. And for the blob samples, we uh, do a normal um, column injection with a split injection. The qualification and quantification was done by um, SMFID. This is more or less a typical uh, coupling of these two detector systems, MS more or less for the qualification of the single components, and FID for the quantification. And the quantification. Um, supports by an internal and external calibration. And you see here on this uh, right side, uh, this is a typical chromatogram of such an analysis. So what can you find on this analysis? Or what can you find on this um, chromatogram from Douglas fir extractives? And the extraction was done with petroleum, ether, acetone, water, and a mixture of them. And uh, these components or this chromatogram was evaluated with some external standards. You find this here on this uh, blue uh, curve. These are uh, the standards chromatogram. And then on the um, colored um, graphs, you find the single chromatograms for the single um, solvents or the solvent systems like acetone, water, and petroleum ether. And what can you see is that we have. Um, a picture of um, different peaks, which are uh, symbolize some uh, single substances. And with the comparison with some external standards, it's possible to get an information about these, um, about the structure and about the um, distribution of the unknown samples. And we find here on different um, 
parts of the quantogram, you find a region which you can find some fatty acids and resin acids between some alkyl standards with uh, carbon numbers from 17 to 21. And then in the middle part, you find some lignin structures which comes from uh, the lignin subunits and some uh, fiber hormones on the sterile systems. Then on the and on the typical second standard, you find here betulin. This is also a known uh, standard uh, solution or standard substance um, which we use for um, an external calibration. And now on the later part of this quantum, you find some complex um, components like uh, longer chained aliphatics um, or like um, some derivatives of um, cholesterol. Um, species or some glycerol species. Now this is a typical separation of these uh, wood extractives and the uh, nature and the, and the structure of these wood extractives depends on the, um, the wood species, of course, depends on the uh, cooling side and depends on the um, health system of, of our um, tree. And not but in a, in a minor state, it depends also on the uh, solvent systems. And you can find here some differences between these solving uh, systems, between the solvents. We have here uh, water as a very polar solvent systems. And we have um, petroleum ether as more or less unpolar system. And acetone, it's a solvent which lies between these, uh, these two um, extreme um, chemical substances with uh, medium and polarity. And if you compare these um, chronograms, then you can find that in some chronograms you have some peaks and some uh, substances which are not on the other one. You can find here, for example, on the water, on the red uh, curve, you have some typical substances like the uh, alkane substances here or like some fatty acids, but if you compare this with the petroleum ether um, solution, then you find on the fatty acid and resin acid side, um, a lot of substances which are not on the water system. So that you have a separation of the systems by using different solvent systems. And if you use an um, other detection system. Um, on the previous uh, slide, this was a uh, detection with a flame ionization de uh, detector. And now you find here a um, chronogram with um, a mass spectrometry detection. And you can see that we have no uh, chronogram for standards. Um, by mass um, chronography system, it is not necessary to use um, external or internal uh, standards for uh, a qualification. Uh, we can use the typical mass vector for qualification of the substances. And here you find uh, some nice information. Uh, in addition to the FID systems, you find uh, a component like the dihydrocamphorol or taxifolin. This was not possible to detect or to to calculate it on the FID system because there are no uh, typical st standards available for this system. But with the um, MS spectrometry and the comparison of a database uh, with a typical mass spectra, it's possible to identify these single components. So the depth of information uh, from a coupling of GC with MS is much higher than a coupling of GC with only FID systems. But if you uh, bring this together, the MS detection and the FID detection, it is possible to identify uh, very complex single substances and to quantify with a um, flame immunization detection system. And this is the advantage of this um, coupling. Now, um, if we <clears throat> Um, change the uh, tree species, then uh, we find out from uh, um, extraction of silver birch, this was extracted with this ternary system of ethanol, um, ethyl acetate, and water, um, also uh, carried out with, um, AS, with this A ASA. And we find here a um, distribution of uh, typical 
component classes over the height of um, a typical model tree. You find here on the picture on the uh, right, left side this model tree. And now on the right side, you find um, uh, a scheme of the um, sample preparation and the sample location on the stem of this tree. And if we bring this together to the analysis of the results, then we find that we have some typical distributions of um, compound classes like carbohydrates, like aromatics and phenols, like terpenes, like hydrocarbons, and over the head of the stem. They have some different um, contents um, on the um, outer bark and inner bark of the system and on the wood. And we have a typical distribution on the head of the, the stem and in uh, depending on the tissues which we analyzed. Another part is um, to use liquid samples to use extractives for uh, chemical taxonomy. And this means that we classify uh, plants based on chemical differences or similarities of, uh, for example, um, extractive uh, systems or extractive components. And these uh, chemical taxonomy uh, focus on the secondary plant uh, products. These are components which are extractable from woods with different solvent systems. And uh, these components are species dependent or used um, by one plant. And with the distribution, you can have an idea about the plant species. And these components consist of different uh, types of polyphenols, of flavonoids, and some types of uh, glycosates. What was the preparation for? Um, at first, it was necessary to manufacture um, from these um, uh, interesting uh, wood species some homogeneous pipe products. You can find this here. We come from the products. We prepared some wood chips. And uh, these wood chips was necessary to produce some pulp and making some paper. And from these papers, uh, the colleagues um, extracted these papers with uh, different uh, solvent systems. And if we analyze this solvent system, then we come to a typical chronogram with a typical contribution and distribution of um, these single components. And what can be, can be done with these uh, single chronogram? So it is possible to um, restructure these um, identified single peaks, which you find here on a, a single a chronogram. You can uh, classify this for different substances. And you can uh, classify also these with this mass spectra uh, to, um, to create a um, database for the um, collection of uh, different um, components and for the identification of some unknown species. And if you will find here a comparison on the right side of um, um, reference substance material on, on this side here and, and on the uh, above, you find also some marker systems for your unknown sample systems and you can find some similarities and some differences and with uh, the comparison of the uh, amount and the quality of the uh, differences and similarities, you can get an um, information about the, um, the possible um, identification of your samples um, to a um, known uh, species. And then um, if you compare this uh, with a uh, known uh, reference samples, then uh, you uh, can have a quality of your uh, search and you can have a quality of your um, identification with uh, known sample materials. So um, this was uh, the liquid samples. Now I want to um, present something about um, solid samples. But I have a question. I'm uh, now on my clock. Um, the time for the first part 
Is it in the next minutes? Um, do we make the break here or after the GC session? I don't know. What's your opinion? How do you like this? I think um, I have uh, three slides with two small videos. Mm -hmm. It's possible to um, yeah to continue to continue on them. Yes, we'll three more decision. slides we will make okay. it, <laughs> and okay. after that we're gonna have coffee and something. Yeah, good. thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. uh, I will hurry. Okay, and now um, on the, uh, this, the first one was the liquid samples. Now we come to the uh, analysis of solid samples. It's also possible on uh, G GCMS. And this sense, um, it is necessary to transfer the solid samples to a vapor. And we can do this by pyrolysis. And it is necessary to pyrolyze um, our um, solid sample material at a certain temperature uh, at a typical pyrolyzer on a certain GC system. You can find on the right side this above this uh, GC oven. And now you have some details here. This is an apparatus which you have here on the, uh, on the top an outer sampler for some small tin cups. And these tin cups falls into this um, tube, into this um, pyrolysis oven. And this um, solid material is heating rapidly on a certain temperature and vaporized. And this vapor is um, transferred directly with carrier gas to our um, GC column in the GC oven and the uh, temperature program can um, begin. And why uh, we do this? Um, it is necessary to decompose the complex uh, structure of wood samples into defined low molecular weight fractions, which we can separate on the GC column. And these uh, fractions depend on the chemical structure on our unknown sample material. And it's possible with uh, the identification of these defined fragments to come to a um, more or less um, holistic um, structure of our unknown wood sample. Now and then I will show you a um, small video for sample preparation. Uh, we can use solid samples. And this are weighed in these small tin cups. Uh, this is not so easy, but you need um, very small amounts of your sample material. And then um, if you use um, liquid sample, it's also possible to weight um, this into this um, thin cups and to use this um, in the same way for pyrolysis and, and for getting some um, information about the structures. And then if you use um, a liquid uh, sample systems, it's also possible to introduce an interim standard for um, pyrolysis and for detection of your systems. And then it's possible uh, to enhance the um, quantification of your uh, sample systems. Okay, and after um, you prepared your um, samples, then it is um, necessary to create a method, to create a sequence on your um, GC machine and to put um, your uh, samples on the auto sampler of the system. And this can you see here. You have, at first you have to unscrew some parts of the uh, top of the um, autos, of the top of the power lines and the auto sampler. Then you, afterwards, you can put the uh, small uh, cups uh, on the outer sampler on different uh, positions.
what it is necessary to complete your system. And uh, if you uh, start uh, your measurement, if you start your treatment, then uh, the stop sample um, is transported to this tube here and falls into the preheated um, pyrolysis oven. And then you have a fast pyrolysis and um, rapid um, vaporization of your solid material. And with the carrier gas, you transfer this vapor directly on the column into the column oven. And what uh, can we um, have re for results? On the uh, right side, you find a typical chronogram of a typical European wood uh, sample with some uh, decomposition products from cellulose and from lignin. And you find here the fluoforal and hydroxymethylfluoforal as typical decomposing products from pyrolysis of cellulose and the vanillin are a typical decomposition product from the lignin. And then you have some intermediate products which are comes from the hemicellulose. Also, levoglucosan is a typical anhydro uh, sugar which comes from the cellulose too. And if you uh, compare this with a um, synthetic material, you find here a typical um, chromatogram of uh, synthetic material of plastics, which um, is derived from a uh, very linear molecule with some certain um, aliphatic structures. And you find here the typical uh, C numbers of your structures, um, starting from C10 bis to uh, C19. So this is a typical structure of an aliphatic um, sample. And this is a so-called homologous um, uh, chain, which you can find um, on the synthetic material. And also this um, homologous chain is used for an internal calibration of um, the FID and the FID system. Now, and uh, these are the next, next, the last slide for uh, uh, before we have to break. Um, we can also do a paralysis outside of the GC system. Um, this uh, is called a um, paralysis um, at a separate reactor, uh, which you find here on the uh, left side. You can uh, paralyze, um, for example, wood chips to a certain uh, distribution of uh, typical solid and liquid products. And these liquid products are um, analyzed by GCMS SLD systems. And you find a typical hologram like you found here on the right side. And you can see that we have, besides the low molecular weight compounds, which you find here, these are not specific for every uh, single material. You can find some specific um, compounds which correspond to the structure of your wood or of your lignin. Here, this was a uh, paralysis of a beach millet wood lignin, and you find here some typical uh, structures which derived from uh, the Guria Kühle subunits from the lignin and some structures here which derived from the Surin Kühle um, subunit. And with this classification, it is possible to, um, to arrange a possible unknown uh, substance to uh, systems of more or less, um, um, for example, um, softwood lignin or more or less hardwood lignin or some components which comes from softwood or hardwood. This is um, also possible with an um, with an pyrolysis and in lab sequence um, GCMS FID measurement and detection. And also you can find here some ideas of uh, holistic uh, structure of your um, sample material. Okay. This was a short overview and a short ride on the uh, analysis of um, uh, wood samples with uh, gas chromatography. And I think um, it is time for a short break. And then uh, after the break, we uh, start and continue with liquid chromatography. That sounds good. Perfect. Um, what about having a 15 minute brings break or 10 minutes? So welcome to the um, second afternoon session. 
Um, we have still one part left. And uh, yeah, we're gonna have a look at uh, the HPLC and um, we will see here the sample preparation. Uh, I forgot, do we want to um, answer question first for, to the first part? Should we, or how, how, how do you think? What do you think about that? Or should we uh, um, uh, keep uh, skip the question part after the HPLC? Uh, I don't see any reaction from the audience. So there's actually, yeah. if there is a question. Okay. No, so we can uh, do it during the resume uh, of the- Okay, so we continue. Yeah. <laughs> Just go forward and uh, yeah. So um, Jan, it's uh, once more your time and we are looking forward to hear about it. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. Is it live again? Yes, everything okay. is live. Uh, yes. Nice, thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, now this was the last slide of our uh, previous session about the gas chromatography, and then I will continue with uh, some ideas and some uh, an overview about the uh, liquid chromatography on the Raspberry site. Um, but at first, I want to start with a general layout uh, comparable to the gas chromatography. And at the previous presentation, we have um, learned about the um, HPSC, but <clears throat> this is uh, only for knowledge. And comparing uh, liquid chromatography and gas chromatography, we have more or less the same systems and the same units, but on the uh, liquid chromatography, uh, we have some differences because we need or we use a um, uh, solvent as a liquid, not, not a solvent, we know use a liquid as a mobile phase, yeah, this is correct. And uh, we have a separation on a surface of some idly round particles on our uh, stationary phase on our column. And the surface of this column can be a native surface or this can be modified by some chemical modifications. Uh, uh, this I'll show you in the next slide. And what are the typical units on uh, HPLC system? At first, we need a tank for some elements for um, our solvents uh, for our mobile phase. And now you see on this picture, this is uh, the HPLC system for the sugar analysis on the vascular side. And you have here the uh, three tangles for the different uh, uh, solvent systems for the sugar analysis. Then um, if you use a um, liquid um, solvent system in a liquid mobile phase, you need a degasser to um, remove some bubbles from your um, solution. You find this thin uh, unit here on the top of the uh, pumps. And uh, this comes to the uh, crucial part of the HPLC system. These are the high pressure pumps. We need some high pressure for moving the uh, liquid phase to the pressure of the uh, stationary phase. This is uh, uh, the stationary phase develop and pressure against the solvent phase. So it needs a high pressure to realize the separation and to realize the work through to the column. Then um, for some comfortable uh, utilization, it is uh, necessary to use an auto sampler, but you can also uh, inject um, uh, manually the uh, uh, samples, but an uh, auto sampler is more comfortable. And the crucial system is the column. And um, on our uh, system in Basbüttel, you find here this small part. I will. Um, switch to the spotlight. And we find here this small part, this is the column on which the um, separation takes place. And then after uh, the column and the separation was done, you need a detector system for um, transferring the um, signal components into elect uh, electric signals and to uh, prepare this for and data evaluation on your data evaluation system. This is right here. 
this is more or less a general um, approach for a um, typical HPLC system. But um, there are some uh, differences to some special um, applications to some special uh, simulation problems. Um, some words about important units. We have five important units, uh, the gasler pump, injector, column, and detector. And it's something is comparable to uh, GCMS systems. Something is completely different to uh, gas chromatography. And the first one is the gasser. It is very important to remove the bubbles from our um, LUN systems because we need a permanent flow of our LUN system to our column. And it is necessary that uh, we use this permanent flow because bubbles interrupt the flow and support some noise uh, during your data evaluation. And how we can do this, uh, it is possible to uh, heat the LUN system at once uh, to uh, remove this bubbles by some ultrasonic application on the vacuum to inject um, an inert gas like helium. And with um, an online degasser system, which is uh, used in this PLC uh, system, it is done by vacuum degassing. So um, if we have a degas um, solution, a degas LUN system, then we need a high pressure pump. And uh, it's necessary to use a high pressure pump because um, the, um, as I mentioned before, the um, stationary phase um, develops a pressure against the solvent phase. And it is necessary and it's a important requirement that we working without any pulsation during this um, LUN flow and with a very small dead volume. And if you have an increase in dead volume, then you need much more solvents to, uh, to reduce this dead volume and to transfer your um, solvent or your uh, solution uh, with your samples into the column, into the column. And this um, pressure um, depends on the viscosity of your LUN systems and the pore size of your um, stationary phase and generally of the uh, packing uh, density of your um, stationary phase. There are some different types. Um, uh, some, uh, sometimes you can use some short stroke double piston pumps. These are a common version for some automated HPLC systems. Uh, now let's come to the injector system. Uh, this is more or less uh, comparable to um, gas chromatography, but um, on the injection system of HPLC, um, we have a heating system. It is not necessary to heat uh, this um, solution, but um, we need some uh, high pressure zeroings to inject these um, our sample material into the high pressure system of the um, column system. Um, the injection system, the material had to be chemically inert and it's also necessary to um, realize a low dead volume into this injection chamber, which you can find here. And uh, besides the uh, typical manual injection system uh, for automatically in injection, it is necessary to use a six port valve because um, you can um, uh, enhance the injection by um, inject of a further sample uh, during the previous uh, measurement uh, carries out. So this is a uh, time consuming, uh, time, uh, not time consuming. So, um, you can um, save time. Uh, you can save time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you can save time uh, for this injection system. Now, um, the column and the texture system is also uh, very important. Um, for um, liquid uh, choreography, um, a packed column is used uh, with defined absorption material. On the bottom, you can find here some pictures of typical um, normal phase systems. This is here on this part. This is a silica gear system 
the, uh, the, the small molecules which are oriented into an inside column. And then you can use some worst phase systems. Then these are made from a silica gel um, base with a modification of a long aliphatic chain. So, and the idea is to uh, reverse the uh, property of the normal phase. Normal phase is uh, more or less a polar system. And now, uh, if by introducing a long aliphatic chain to the silica gel structure, you can reverse this uh, polar system to unpolar system. And then it's possible to uh, separate other uh, components with uh, some specific polarities. And this, um, the performance of such a stationary phase uh, depends on the pore structure of this more or less silica gel. Um, filling or you have a certain ways in filling, then you can adjust the pore structure and the pore size. And uh, besides the structure of the pores and the structure of the particles, it is possible to adjust the chemical modification on the surface of these uh, particles. So you can adjust with these chemical modification the performance on specific and uh, separation problems. So that for a different specific problems and single and an optimal uh, stationary phase exists. And then um, after the separation um, uh, carry out, then we come to the detection system. And this is comparable to the GCMS or GC systems. We need detectors with high resolution and uh, a low noise. And it is necessary that the response from the detector is independent from the each HPLC parameters like pressure or like um, solvent velocity or like the uh, loading of the um, color. Common detectors for um, HPLC are um, UV visible detectors for um, visible lights on UV lights or an um, refractometry index detector. This is the second common detector for. Um, such liquid uh, quantum phase systems. Um, it's also possible to use uh, MS systems, but these are very expensive. And for uh, the uh, utilization of um, UV with detectors, it is necessary uh, to have some chromophoric structures on your uh, sample material so that we can uh, measure the, the arrangement of the uh, color of the, of the sample. And um, this is not necessary for the um, RE detector. Here, uh, the reflection of a sample and a reference solution is measured. Um, for an RE detection, it is necessary to um, refill the reference uh, cell for um, measuring the um, variation of the uh, refraction of a, of a sample solution. And this uh, detector is not uh, suitable for some um, gradients of elements. We can also use this for isoquartic separation. This is, was a short overview about these uh, main units of um, liquid chromatography. Now we want to come to the strategy how we can um, realize uh, separation by HPLC. The main topics are the two topics uh, which, um, which I mentioned before is the choice and preparation of the sample, the uh, choice of the equipment and the method design and the uh, task for data evaluation. Now let's come to the seven material. Um, it is necessary that uh, you choose a solvent in which the sample is, um, can be saluted, uh, can be uh, completely saluted. And uh, in addition to this, it is necessary that this solution is free of particles. And you have to uh, filtrate this solution because uh, particles uh, can block the stationary phase and can reduce the selectivity and can reduce the performance of the stationary phase. And for this, um, it is also necessary to prepare your solution by a pre-treatment 
or to prepare your wood sample materials because wood is not possible to uh, analyze uh, by HVAC directly. So it is necessary to separate these components into uh, different fractions. And we, for uh, analysis of wood sugars, for example, it is necessary to uh, carry out an hydrolysis of your uh, wood materials to produce free sugars, which you can analyze uh, during the quantitative systems. And besides this, as I mentioned before, you need compounds which are detectable with, um, uh, with a UV vis detector. You need some chromophores, also you need some um, colored compounds, or um, it is also necessary um, to uh, use your sample uh, regarding the RE detection systems. Yeah, now let's come to the equipment and the method developing. And it is at first necessary to think about the LON system. Um, the LON system it have to um, have to compare and have to suit to the um, uh, solvent system or the solvent in which you, uh, the, the sample is soluted. And again. Um, for the topic of um, using a gradient or using an isocratic system, this uh, can be necessary, can be important for the choosing of the detector system. If you use a UV vis detector, then you can use also an uh, isocratic system without an uh, LOM gradient, or you can use an LOM gradient. Then for separation, it is uh, necessary to choose uh, a suitable column. Uh, you can choose the normal phase, the reverse phase column. You can make an ion exchange. And this is uh, uh, important for the analysis of the wood sugars. And the performance depends on the porosity of the solid um, phase material, about the chemical modifications on the surface of this um, absorption material, and so on. And um, one part is uh, to um, choose a certain temperature program <clears throat> for um, liquid chromatography. And these uh, systems are carried out at ambient temperature above uh, 100, no, not 100 degrees, in the near of 100 degrees, for example. This is more or less a water. But uh, on a GC uh, system, you have temperature from ambient temperatures to 300, 400 degrees. It's also possible for high temperature chromatography. So, and, and HPSC uh, was uh, carrying out at lower temperatures. And of course, um, the detector is also important um, for um, getting some signals. And, Comparable to a GC, uh, you can make some non target analysis or some target analysis. But um, the evaluation of uh, these um, results and the selectivity of your um, results at the uh, stationary pace of the liquid chromography is not so good as the um, results which you can get from the GC systems. And uh, last but not least, um, some questions of quality dimensions um, have to be answered um, during the measurements. So, now I want to show you an example for the analysis of some wood sugars. Um, we can use some wood or some animal plants for our um, um, HPLC system. Um, you need a pretreatment. Um, we carry out an hydrolysis to separate um, the lignin and uh, cellulose fractions and to transfer the uh, bonded sugars into a free form. Um, at our lab, um, a two stage hydrolysis um, was developed for um, this pretreatment. And then it is necessary to make a filtration of the system um, to remove the particles um, which comes from the wood sample and to dissolve it uh, some uh, solutions um, because um, salts can interrupt 
the separation and the uh, uh, further reactions on our uh, system. And the system uh, which we analyze the uh, root sugars are uh, HPAEC borate system. This is a high pressure anion exchange chromatography with borate. This is the wrong name. <laughs> and this um, is an ion exchange column which we use for the separation with a post treatment. And uh, we qualify and quantify the um, signals by UI this detection and an external calibration with reference uh, materials. Now, what are the challenges of, um, the, of analyzing wood sugars? Um, in nature, wood sugars are extreme polar and sometimes they exist in as ions. So it is um, very hard to uh, separate it with a normal phase or a worse phase at the liquid chromatography. So no, you need a uh, and ion exchange chromatography. And this is the, uh, the perfect method for separating ions or to using ions for uh, transferring of ions and exchange ions. Then uh, on sugars, we have a big uh, similarity in structures. They are also um, varies in one functional group or on the position of a one functional group, but the whole structure is more or less the same. And uh, in addition to this, um, the sugar structures are non chromophoric So um, if we use this in a native state, uh, we cannot detect these um, substances with a UV vis detector. So it is necessary to make a post treatment to bring a chromophoric system into the sugars, and then we can uh, detect this with this, our detection systems. And um, for wood sugar analysis, it is necessary to, um, to use a creative and illusion system. So um, for this, it is not possible to use an RE detection system. So the only detection system which we can use is the UV VIS detection system. So um, before we come to uh, the analysis of our wood sugars, um, you see here on the right side the scheme for uh, the uh, pre-treatment of the wood samples before we can analyze the wood sugars. At first, uh, we can make an extraction with some um, um, organic solvent systems with hot water to remove the extractives, uh, which can disturb the measurements during the wood sugar analysis. And then we have here the two-stage hydrolysis system. We have a free hydrolysis with a um, uh, high concentrated sulfur acid under vacuum uh, for a half an hour and uh, for one hour and 30 degree. And then um, after this pre hydrolysis step, we add some water on the autoclave and uh, increase the temperature for one hour to carry out this second hydrolysis step. Then afterwards, um, we filtrate the system to separate uh, into some uh, soluble carbohydrate systems, which you can find here, and some acid soluble lignin, and this is um, filtered um, afterwards. And then um, for the residues, these are more or less uh, the glass and lignin subfraction, which we can uh, um, estimate gravimetrically. The acid soluble lignin is possible to make some uh, UV spectroscopy for uh, a knowledge of the structure. And with the carbohydrate, we can make these anion exchange chromatography. Now, here on the right side, you'll find the reaction equation for the uh, decomposition of this uh, polymeric um, sugar chain with water and acid into these um, sugar monomers. And these monomers are possible to uh, separate and analyze by this chromatography system. So now let's come back to our HPAC borate system. And you find here on the left side um, a structure of the system. This is more or less comparable to a general scheme, but um, important is the post-treatment section. You find this here on the oil bath and on the cooling system. But before uh, we can make a post-treatment, it's necessary to 
add some uh, bored proof of solutions at the uh, LON systems to, the, to our um, uh, sample material. And you find here an equation. Um, it is possible that um, the sugar monomers create some complex with the uh, bow weight. And this bow weight complex can interact with the column material, which you find here. And uh, through this interaction, you have a separation on this uh, column material. And then you can have single fractions uh, which you can uh, salute from the uh, sectional phase, and then you can carry out the post-treatment. The post-treatment um, is done by this copper B chinat solution. This is a, um, a happy word. And it's also a complex system uh, with copper. And these complex uh, bring us the chromophoric um, structure into the sugars. And during uh, this post-treatment, um, it is necessary to, uh, to react that this complex react with our sugar monomers, forming this uh, chromic fork system. And this system is detectable with UV vis. And uh, you find here on the right side, um, this is a structural formula of um, glucose. And for this uh, formation of this uh, copper, Chromophoric complex, you need some reducing sugars. You need a free aldehyde group on this end of this um, uh, sugar molecule. And if there is no um, reducing end, then a complex cannot be formed. And then it's no signal uh, which you can detect on your system. Now, um, this is more or less um, theoretically, um, I will show you a small um, video in which you can see the reaction and the formation of some chromophoric um, systems. At first, um, it's necessary to prepare the, uh, the Borat solutions by mixing of uh, these two Borat buffers. And by mixing um, them uh, and preparing this post treatment solution. This is the post treatment solution. This is this blue color that you can find here. And this is this, uh, in, this, is this blue colored uh, complex. So we have two samples. This is sample one. First preparing the um, buffer solutions and mixing with the um, post treatment solution. This is done after the separation at the column at the post treatment step. So and this is our sample material. Now heating on the oil bath. And there is no changements of the color. Now we come to sample two, the same procedure. This is an up sugar, then number one. And now reacting on post treatment step. Becomes darker and darker. Put it to the boiling point of the water around 100 degree. And now this is the end. You can see an infringement between them the one and them the two. Um, this is the sample without 
sugars with or without reducing sugars, um, we use for this um, uh, a cube of uh, industrial sugars, so this is saccharose. And now um, for this sample two, we uh, use um, uh, glucose powder and glucose have this reducing end on this molecule. And then we, you can uh, observe this um, changement from a blue um, solution to a darker solution. And this changement you can measure by the UV mist detection system. And um, a few words about the results. Um, here you can find uh, different types of chronograms of single uh, wood uh, species like spruce wood, eucalyptus wood, and some pulp, uh, which are made from these woods. And you find here a typical distribution of uh, free reducing sugars, which comes from the hydrolysis of the uh, wood. Material you have here on the spruce wood, mannose, albinose, galactose, xylose, and glucose. And uh, in comparison to the eucalyptus uh, wood, you have uh, lesser amounts of mannose, no albinose, lesser amounts of galactose. Uh, then comparing to this um, hot, uh, soft wood system, we have on, on eucalyptus wood, you have higher uh, amounts of xylose and uh, more or less uh, the same amounts of glucose. And if you uh, make a treatment of this wood uh, by uh, pulp production, then you have also a uh, variation of the free sugar distribution into higher amounts of glucose, which is forming by uh, the pulp parameters during the uh, pulping system. And we have more or less um, higher amounts and um, not, not higher, um, lower amounts of silos, but higher amounts of manos. And this is a typical distribution of these um, sugars. And with these sugars, you can find this here, the results on the table at the bottom. Um, you can have more or less fingerprint system of the uh, wood species, which you can found on your unknown sample. This is possible uh, to, um, monitor the reducing sugars. So um, I want to summarize uh, my uh, presentation with uh, one slide uh, as a comparison of the GC and HPLC uh, systems. And we can do this by four, uh, five, or six, six uh, parameters, excuse me, six parameters. <laughs> And uh, these are the sample, the stationary phase, mobile phase. These are the some important um, um, units for the separation. Uh, we can compare the resolution of uh, these systems, the detector systems, and the possibility of couplings. So on uh, liquid chronography, this is have a broad application. There are no limitations for sample materials. In uh, opposite to the gas chromatography, you um, need volatile compounds. And this is approximately uh, amount of 10 to 20% of the uh, organic compounds can be um, analyzed by uh, GC systems. You can increase uh, this amount of uh, analyzing systems uh, by carrying out some der der derivatization uh, um, methods but the um, evaluation of the structure and the evaluation of the result is uh, very complex and very difficult. The stationary phase of both systems are variable. You have uh, a lot of um, systems, a lot of materials which you can use for um, separation. And all these systems are adjusted to different and certain um, separation problems. On mobile phase, uh, on uh, liquid chronography, you can use every solvent. Uh, you can use solvent mixtures. And this system is very variable uh, for using uh, liquids. And it's also possible to use some supercritical liquids. This is an um, exception of this uh, typical classical um, system for gas and liquid chronography. On gas chronography, you use inert gases like hydrogen or nitrogen and helium. And if you use hydrogen, uh, you have some uh, better response 
uh, to lower costs instead of the usage of helium. Helium is very expensive in, uh, uh, in the last time, so that is uh, better to uh, transfer from helium to hydrogen as a carrier gas. What's about the, the resolution? The resolution on GC is very high. This is a very good system with a very high efficiency to detect um, single compounds to, um, to explain the structure of single compounds, for example, by MS um, spectroscopy or MS spectrometry. And in contrast to the HPLC systems, uh, we have a good, uh, a good resolution, but a minor efficiency than uh, GC systems. But um, HPLC systems have a higher selectivity than uh, GC systems. So it is possible to uh, remove, uh, to separate um, substances with HPLC, which are not um, uh, separatable by GC systems. So um, this means it is possible to um, separate systems with a higher molecular weight. And these, for these um, challenges, um, HPLC is the better choice than GC systems. On detector systems, on GC, we have a selection of different efficiency, efficient detectors like a flame initiation detector, this is uh, common, like uh, mass spectrometry, this is also common. Then you have, uh, you have uh, non-carbon -contain, non containing. Um, samples, you can use the uh, thermal conductivity detectors. And for some special cases, we have different detectors for um, analyzing some special ions, analyzing some special substances. Um, in contrast to the HPLC, we have no universal usable and sensitive detector. We have only the UEVIS and the RE detector for a more or less um, a standard repertoire. And then we can uh, use uh, MS for um, some uh, valuable um, compounds. We can use other detectors, but it is not um, so efficient uh, in comparison to the GC detector systems. And now at, uh, we come to the last point, to the uh, possibility of coupling different systems and different detection systems. On uh, gas chromatography, it is common to use a coupling with uh, mass spectrometry and flame ionization detection. Uh, we, we carry out this here on our website. Then you can uh, couple two mass spectrometer for two-dimensional um, evaluation of data, or you can couple two GC systems for two-dimensional um, separation. So this is a broad field of uh, couplings and it's a broad field of um, data which you can get. Um, and it is, if you increase the, um, the weight of coupling, the weight of um, dimensions for separation, then you um, increase the amount of data and it is necessary to choose some statistical reduction processes to reduce the amount of the data. And uh, coupling with uh, HPLC systems is less powerful than GC coupling. Um, there are possible to couple different detectors, but it is not so, um, it's not so a strong tool than a coupling on the gas chromatography. And now this was the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I, this was a tour de force a tour the chromatography systems. Um, I hope you have uh, you can get some ideas about this what we do here uh, in uh, the Tunen Institute on the um, analysis of the uh, cellular components of the wood species. Thank you very much for your attention and. I hope we have time for questions. I mentioned also tannins, but what are they and why are they so interesting and important? So tannins belong to secondary metabolites and therefore they play an important role in plant defense. Uh, not only 
tannins are represented by these functions. Also, other types of substances like phenols, uh, volatile terpenes, and alkaloids containing nitrogen are counted to the secondary metabolites. So th those metabolites have the functions in plant defense, but besides this function, they have also many other functions, like for instance, coloring, perfuming, flavoring, or other medicinal benefits like anti-cancer or antibiotic properties. When it comes to tannins, they are divided into two groups based on the main structural unit and the properties of the, of the group. In hydrolyzable tannins, it is gallic acid, the main structural unit, which is bound to glucose. In condensed tannins, the main unit is so-called plavan 3 ol which is repeated more times. Tannins can be found as oligo or polymeric form. And they are also feasible to oxidize or bond to proteins and polysaccharides and are thermosensitive. Because the OH groups might be substituted by other compounds, the reaction prediction with exception of the standard molecules is therefore quite tricky. As you can see, the mechanism is not the same because you have more variability in, in the structure, in the substitution and many different uh, aspects when it comes to reaction mechanism. Uh, just to give you a short overview about mainly applied methods in tannin analysis, one of the simplest and method of first choice would be colorimetric method using reagent. When we obtain a complex that shows absorbance in UV or visible spectrum. The second very important and very often applied is the HPLC, which is for separation and highly precise quantification and qualification of more polyphenolic types. And another option is to visualize the implemented tannins in wood structure by microscopy or more focused on concentration distribution via UMSP. You have had probably a really nice overview in the morning. I hope so. Of course, there are also many other methods The essay for the total final content belongs to the simplest and well known for the determination of phenols in plant matrices. The final complex shows, as you can see on the picture, bluish color, and the intensity is proportional to the concentration of the standard. As a representative molecule, gallic acid is commonly selected. Also, you can see the gallic acid molecule right bottom. It is widely known that higher phenolic content, when it's the higher, the better is the resistance against microorganisms. In our short experiment, we measured the total phenolic content and we also did the durability test. And it came out that Robinia phenols were not as effective in defense against fungi as those panels from Brazilian Acacia. The main aim, as I already mentioned, the HPLC analysis is to uh, quantify and qualify the separated present molecules when they are nicely separated. So uh, the picture is a nice example how it should look like. As you can see, different phenolic structures leave the column a different time, time axis is on is x axis. Uh, and this example shows a uh, proper distinguishment of 28 polyphenolic uh, substances in several uh, food samples. 
but in our case, we have a sample of commercial acacia bark extract that contains mainly flavantriols. The separation by HPLC does not look similar to the previous slide. As you can see, or maybe you guess, the huge amounts of not well separated peaks in the on the top uh, are those polymers of our interest. Even when we use acid or alkaline hydrolysis, we get some interesting monomers, but the main part somehow disappears into the insoluble parts because tannins get then their oligo or even polymeric structure. When we think traditionally in terms of wood modification, where the weight percent gain is calculated, this is how the impregnation efficiency is, is taken into account. One could see that some milligram, even if it's not well seen in the picture of SEM, uh, some milligrams remain somewhere. So the question is where? when even small increase in phenols helps with wood durability, how much is needed and how can it be fixed like naturally synthesized? A study about impregnation and leaching behavior of poplar and beech treated with robinia extract has been done previously in collaboration with Tunan Institute and the increased absorbances at 278 nanometers uh, via UMSP indicate the presence of phenolic substances. So based on the previous successful results, we hope that another possible example of tiny visualization by UMSP might be interesting and feasible after beech wood impregnation with several acacia tannins and concentration, and also possibly other extract types, uh, and also to see the absorption changes when the samples were exposed to fungi. So to sum up, I would say that flavonoids in general have many beneficial properties. However, they are quite complex, so the results depend not only on the extraction and analysis the selection, but also on the climate conditions, location where the plant or the tree grows, and how much those compounds get accumulated into the, into the species. So also chemical character within same species may differ. So also when it comes to the analysis, Ideally, more techniques are necessary to obtain the complex information, but it's not just switching some device on and just see the results. So it's a longer way to get all these informations. <laughs>